So let's take our Bibles this morning and open up to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we, we began uh, a series talking about the purpose, God's purpose for Christians, God's purpose for us as a church. And we looked at uh, Paul as, he's, as he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, trying to help the church at Corinth with their problems and their divisions. And uh, he gave three analogies. He, he spoke about a family maturing, is what we're going to cover today. And uh, he spoke about those who worked the field, the planted, and, and those, who, um, those who sowed, those who watered, but God gave the increase. And in the third analogy, he speaks about the church as being a building. And he laid a foundation. The foundation was laid by Jesus Christ, and every man will build upon that. And we'll look at that in, the, uh, in next Sunday uh, as we look at these three things that Paul began to give the church at Corinth to help them understand. And God's purpose for them. And so today we want to take our reading for, from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you could stand and honor reading God's word, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, also turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. So keep your fingers there in 1 Corinthians, but also let's have a look at a comparative passage in Hebrews chapter 5. And we'll take our reading from there as well. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Bible says this in verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife, and divisions are ye not carnal and walk as men for while one saith i am of paul and another i am of apollos are ye not carnal who then is paul and who is apollos but ministers by whom ye believe even as the lord gave to every man let's look in hebrews chapter 5 hebrews 5 and Paul, the writer of the Hebrews, I believe is Paul, and here in chapter 5, he's talking about Christ and, and all that he has done. And, and verse 8 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God a high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil May the lord add his blessing to his word this morning i want to bring a message to you entitled god's purpose for, for christians is spiritual maturity god wants us to grow in spirit not just physically in body but also in spirit. May the Lord help us this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just need you in this hour. Lord, help us now in the next few moments. May we, Lord, uh, truly draw our hearts and, and in concentration around your word. We pray that we will not be distracted. Pray, Lord, that the wicked one will not rob us from this, the good seed of God's word today. Pray, Lord, that you would help us today. Illuminate our eyes of understanding, Lord. We desperately need you in this hour. Help me, Father, to speak those things that you would have me to say. May it be not just the words of a man, but, Lord, that the Spirit of God would truly take the word of God and minister it to every heart today. And we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Do you, remember, do you remember the time when you had your children? Do you remember that day, maybe in hospital? You know, maybe... Uh, those of you who have older children, back in those days, they never let you in to see your kids. 
I remember, you know, when Jeremy was being born, uh, it was one of the new things. The father had to go in and experience the birth. And uh, all of our kids were, were, not, uh, were through C-section, so it was all a controlled environment. And uh, you would sit there next to your wife's uh, head and they have this sheet up there uh, to, so you don't see exactly the operation that's taking place. Well, I was quite intrigued. I, I wanted to see what's going on behind that curtain, behind that, that sheet there. So I, I kind of stood up to have a look and the anaesthetist put his hand on my shoulders and pushed me back down into my seat. He says, Mr. Yusuf, this is not a soccer match. This is not for you to sit there and be a spectator. Uh, you know, you'd be here to support your wife. But I remember when the child came out and, and uh, Jeremy was born and, and you know, you, you have this image in your, in your mind that this child's going to come out nice and healthy in pink. Now, those of you who've been there, you see what they come out like. And they're blue and like, is he alive? Is he, is he okay? And, and uh, you know, when they begin to cry, you just see this transformation. The, blue, the blueness in their body is just disappearing and it's turning into pink. And, and then you're rejoicing, thinking, yes, it's a boy. Oh, yes, it's a girl. And, and you're enjoying that experience, right? I remember the first time when I held my daughter, Larissa, in my arms. Uh, you know, I, I cried. Uh, the two boys, I didn't really... You know, I was happy, but the girl, the girl came. And people say, why do you rejoice when a girl comes? You know, because when she grows up, she's going to be more affectionate towards me. And so I, I cried as I held her in my hands, and I enjoyed and rejoiced that God gave us a wonderful baby. But you know, in that moment, we all understand that the joy of that moment is a great experience. But later, we want to see those kids grow, don't we? We want to see those kids develop. Uh, we don't want to, as much as we enjoyed holding them in our arms and in our hands and experience that great moment, we know we don't want them to stay in that state. Uh, for if time goes by and they have not matured, we're no longer rejoicing over that state, are we? We get a little bit worried. Uh, we get a little bit anxious and saying, uh, my baby really hasn't put on weight. Uh, my baby is not feeding. My, my baby is not developing. And uh, we go to all different concerns and we go see doctors or we get them examined. Or we want to know, we want to find out why this child is not growing. We put all our money and all our effort and all our concern about why my child is not developing. Some of us get a little bit offended when our kids start you know, at school and uh, you know, they have to repeat a grade. Well, your son is not really ready. Uh, they haven't matured yet in order for them to tackle the new things that they have to learn. And we said, well, my, my son is already five, like, you know, he's grown in age, and, but he should, or he should be in that year, or he should continue. But what we've forgotten is maybe they have lagged behind in their development, and we need to help them in that growth path, in that development. Well, this is what Paul was really addressing here in this passage. You know, many Christians have, been, have come to know Christ for many, many years. You know, sometimes we, we look at Christianity and we, when we consider ourselves as Christians, uh, we look at the number of years that we have been a Christian. So you talk to somebody and say, well, how long have you known the Lord? Well, you know what? I got saved back in 1979. And you think, wow, some of us weren't born before 1979. And, and you say, well, you've been, a, you've been a Christian now for 40 odd years. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes we look at the number of years that we were in Christ as being a veteran. Now, I'm a veteran Christian because I have been a Christian for such a long time. But reality is not the number of years that you were a Christian. Uh, what would be our concern is not how old your child is. Our concern is how well developed is your child. Isn't that right? Uh, has your child developed in accordance with those years? Or has he got developed beyond those years? That's what we're interested in. It's sad sometimes when you see someone... He might be in his 40s. He should be a responsible adult, but he's still immature as a teenager. And he's still concerned about playing video games. He still you know, wants to hang out with mates and do you know, exciting stuff. They're always looking for the thrill. You know, when, you look, when you examine a man who is by that age and still thinking as a teenager, there's a problem. There's a problem. Paul said this in, in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, When I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. 
You see, there has to be a maturing process. We all understand that. We all understand about the physical life that we thrive and we, we enjoy and we want to see our children, our families just develop, mature and grow. That's a great burden to us when we find that our children or members of our family are not growing and are not developing. We get a little bit concerned. We get a little bit concerned when our, when our boys are, you know, are in their 20s now and they're still irresponsible. They still haven't taken on responsibility well. They, they haven't matured in their own minds as men. They're still little boys. You know, we live in an era today that uh, it promotes this, this adolescent period. Uh, this period where we give space and, and we allow our children to be negligent and, and just to do whatever they want because we said they're teenagers. Uh, I like a little article uh, that was written by, the, by Diana, Diana West and she's a syndicate economist for the Washington Times and she laments this cultural phenomenon in her book, The Death of the Grown-Up. And uh, this is what she says, once there was a world without teenagers, Literally, teenager, the word itself, doesn't pop into the lexicon much before 1941. This speaks volume about the last few millennia. In all those centuries, nobody thought to mention teenagers because there was nothing apparently to think of mentioning. In considering what I like to call the death of the grown-up, it's important to keep a fix on this fact that for all but this most present episode of human history, there were children and there were adults. Children in their teen years aspired to adulthood. Significantly, they didn't aspire to adolescence. Certainly, adults didn't aspire to remain as teenagers. A lot of things have changed. For one thing, turning 13 nowadays, instead of bringing children closer to the adult world, now launches them into a teen universe. For another, due to the permanent hold our culture has placed on the mat maturation process, that where they're likely to find most adults, the National Academy of Sciences has in 2002 redefined adolescence as the period extending from the onset of puberty around 12 to 30. These are grown-ups who haven't left childhood. Let me say that this phenomenon has also extended into our Christian lives and in Christian churches. Paul, here in this passage, uh, in these passages, is uh, helping, is helping the church understand that there's a need to mature. There's a need to mature in our Christian life. Uh, the Lord didn't save us just to take us to heaven. Uh, if that was God's purpose, we've, all, we've always said this, didn't we? If God's purpose was just to save me from uh, the lake of fire, then the time when I came by repentance and faith, accepting the grace of God in my life, God's purpose is fulfilled. And so that's it. I should just, life should end and I should just go to heaven. You see, the entry point to a, mature, to a life that is mature in Christ is coming to know Jesus as your personal saviour. And the first step into a life of relationship with Christ is by believing on Him. Now, I'm going to ask you this morning, have you taken that step? Have you this morning come to the point in your life and your realization that you needed Christ in your life? You know that you're a sinner. You know you've done things against God. You know that there's nothing you can offer the Lord in exchange for your sin. That there's nothing that is comparable that will forgive that sin. Let me tell you this morning, there's great hope in Jesus. He came and died for you and for me. He paid for your sin and my sin. And so when we come by faith, believing on Christ, that he paid it all. I no longer have to work for my salvation. I no longer have to prove myself to God that he would take me to heaven. Jesus did it all for me. And now the life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God that loved me and gave himself for me. Now I live every day because I love the Lord and I want to please him with my life. And so begins a journey of spiritual maturity. Now the sad thing is that some of us have come to know Christ and we began this journey, but we, just became, we, we were just content. We're just content that we've been born again. And we're content that, that we, if we die, we're just going to heaven. 
And we live the rest of life here on earth struggling, immature in our responses, immature as believers, uh, not handling the Word of God correctly, not making the right choices along the way. And, and so our life becomes a, a, a boisterous time of, a, you know, of ups and downs. And, and I'm not sure whether I made the right decision. I'm not sure if God is with me. I'm not sure if God is, gonna, is pleased or God is going to bless this. And we are in turmoil and doubt. But God did not call us to that kind of Christian life. God wants us. God's purpose for the Christian and for the church is that we mature spiritually. That we mature spiritually. I want us to look this morning in God's word, uh, there in our passage, I want us to look at three things, uh, three evidences uh, of what we need to have in our life to demonstrate that we have matured as Christians. Three, th three evidences that I believe every Christian needs to examine. We need to examine our hearts, we need to ex examine our lives and, and see whether these are present or prevalent in our life. And by this we can see the growth, uh, the, the growth opportunities, uh, things that are in life that need to be adjusted in order for us to mature as Christians. Well, firstly, I want you to see in this passage, as Paul was talking to the church uh, about Christ, he said to them, I could not speak to you as spiritual, but as calm. Paul distinguishes, uh, the, 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 distinguishes humanity into two categories or three categories. First category is the, the spiritual man who has spiritual understanding of God's word and the things of God and the carnal man. Uh, sorry, the, the natural man. The natural man is one who cannot understand the things of God. Uh, he needs the help of the Holy Spirit to illuminate him, to understand the depths and the truths of God that are in his words. That's why some people, they read the Bible, they may sit in preaching, and, and some of the stuff just kind of just, they just can't comprehend. Well, the natural man in his own ability will not be able to comprehend the things of God. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit that he comes alongside and God and illuminates and shows them and brings them understanding to the word. So we have a natural man who without the spirit of God cannot understand the things of God. But then we have the spiritual man. And Paul breaks down the spiritual man into a third category, which he calls him the carnal man. Now, the, the carnal man is the one that, that has been illuminated to truth. He, he knows God. He knows the Word of God. He, he knows his Savior. Uh, he knows Jesus as his Savior. But this man has not developed and has not grown in his understanding of who God is and what God expects from him and what the Word of God teaches him to be as he matures. So he says to him, you're still a babe. Uh, he uses this analogy as, as, a, as a family with a little child. He says, uh, I, I could not speak to you as mature people. I had to speak to you as ones who were as babes, as infants. And it's quite sad that when we could be in the faith for so many years, yet we are still babes in Christ. And he even likens it, he says uh, uh, that, you know, uh, uh, that you, uh, you cannot handle the meat. You're still on the sincere milk of the word. You're still on the milk of the word. Uh, so we can see, we can define uh, our maturity by our ability to, uh, by our appetite. So uh, if you are still today on the sincere milk of the word, you're still a babe. You're still a babe. My wife has began to, you know, cook vegetables and kind of put them in that thermomix and make them into purees. And uh, so all of a sudden now we've got another child on our hands. And, and uh, so she makes the stuff and puts it into these uh, 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 feeding satchels for Isla, our granddaughter. And uh, we, we now are excited. Like she's not just having her bottle. Guess what she's having now? She's onto some solids. Now she's not eating steak yet. But she's, you know, she's eating some vegetables. Uh, so we can see her diet is just progressing, right? And uh, we get excited. Did you know, she, Sharon Cameron says, do you know that she's eating now the food that I'm preparing for her? We get a little bit excited when we see that kind of progress. But you know, Paul said to the church, I could not give you anything that was heavy. I, I need to come to you and talk to you with the simplicity of manners. Uh, I had to just continue talking to you about the ABCs of Christianity. 
Uh, some of us today, uh, we, when we take our Bible, for instance, to read, uh, we want to look for the stories. Well, I want to read the story of David and Goliath. I want to read the story of Noah and the ark. I want to read the story of King David. And all we're fascinated by is just the stories. And these are good stories, don't get me wrong. But have you matured yet in your spiritual walk to handle the doctrines that are in the Word of God? Sometimes we, when we speak about certain matters, uh, people sit there and say, Pastor, I didn't get any of that. It just went straight over my head. I, I, didn't, I could, just couldn't understand anything. It just went woof, straight over my head. My question to you is, if you're finding yourself in that position too often, then there's a problem in our maturity. There's a problem in our growth as Christians. Our appetite is always centered around the sincere milk. Uh, Paul wants us in, in the book of Hebrews, he says, uh, we, we need to put aside, lay aside these things about the foundations, the foundational elements of Christ and what he's done, his sacrifice and of laying of hands, etc. Uh, you know, these things we can address later, but, the, but Christians, are we able to handle more than the ABC of Christianity? Wouldn't it be amazing if we had a church here of people who all knew their Bible well? Can you imagine what this church would be like? Imagine what this place would be like where we have people who have grown and matured in Christ. They know the Word of God. They're, they're not just wondering about the ABCs. They're, they're not just, oh, well, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Uh, they're able to really root themselves deeply in God's Word and understand some of those things that may be a little bit difficult for the natural man or for just the carnal man to understand. That's why we encourage you as Christians, we encourage you that you come and attend some of our institute classes. That's why we have these courses that we run on Monday nights and Tuesday nights. And, and this is not just extracurricular activity that, you know, we'd like to put ourselves through. This is not pastor's got nothing else to do on a Monday night or a Tuesday night and, and he just needs to create some work for himself. No, we have a desire to see you rooted in God's word and to grow. Some of us... Uh, uh, are a little bit intimidated by even giving the gospel to someone because we use this excuse. I don't know much about the Bible. I'm afraid they might ask me a question I can't answer. And Satan uses that line in our lives and we use it as an excuse why we don't share the gospel, why we don't reach out and tell someone about Jesus because we say, I'm still a baby on the milk. Well, that ought not to be so. Hey, I understand that if you came to know Jesus as your Savior and uh, you're still a babe in Christ, you've just recently came to know Jesus, I understand that. I understand that you're still being nurtured and you're being trained and you're growing. But we should not be content about staying as little babes. We should not be content to say, well, I'm saved and, and I'm glad that I'm part of this church and, and that's all we have. No, we need to grow and to be developed in the Word. Well, one evidence of us maturing in Christ is our ability to understand the deeper things of Christ, the deeper things that are in the Word of God. I can sit and listen to a message, I can sit and do a course, I can study my Bible and I want to know further, I want to know the riches of Christ that are in His Word. Some of us open up our Bibles and really for us we say, yeah, I've read my Bible, I've done a chapter. I do a chapter of a day. Well, praise the Lord, that's a good start. That is a good start. But how much are you delving deep into what you're reading? I'm not asking you just reading it as a newspaper. I'm asking read and then study. Read and memorize. Uh, read and let it sink and meditate. Let it sink into your heart and into your mind to understand the true riches that we have in Christ Jesus. 2 Peter 1 tells us that God has given us all things pertaining to godliness. He's given us his divine, per, his, his divine promises. God's word is rich with promises and instructions that will help us to grow and mature in Christ. What are you doing about maturing in God's word? How serious are you about maturing in God's word? What are the steps have you taken to come to know the Lord in a deeper way. You know, I just find it quite ironic. We have time to do everything else. 
We have time to go to the gym. We have time to watch TV. We have time to watch things on the internet. We have time to laze around. We have time to work. We have time for everything else. But when it comes to just taking half an hour to spend with God, it becomes the biggest struggle in our life. Why is that? Why is it that it, we are so easy to spend time everywhere else, but when it just comes, I have to spend time with God and grow in His Word, that there is every single reason why I can't do it. The phone goes off, somebody calls me, someone knocks on my door, someone needs me. Why is it that we struggle to set that time aside? You know, if God gives us 168 hours in a week, 168 hours God gives you. Just put that in comparison, 168 hours. If you were just to come to church for three hours a week, and if you were to pray every day, spend time in God's Word, right? That's one hour. One hour every day. That's seven hours plus three hours or four hours. Call it 14 hours. 14 hours with God. Now, that's less than 10% of the total time God gave you for the week. It's less than 10%. We can spend our time sleeping. We can spend our time working. We can spend our time doing every other activity. But this one thing that is necessary for our spiritual maturity, we have no time for. I have no time, Pastor. I have no time to sit and come to a class to study. I, Pastor, I have no time to really go through a discipleship class uh, because I'm too busy. How is it that we've got our priorities the wrong way around? You see, if we don't give ourselves to maturing in God's Word, we're going to continue to be babes. You know what the danger of being staying as a babe in Christ? You know, a child can't discern things, right? Uh, you can just, you can just uh, woo him and lure him with just a lolly. Yeah? Just say, hey, come get this, this piece of chocolate. And he'll come to you and he will love you and he will do whatever you ask him to do because you lured him with something that is insignificant. And you know, that is what the world is doing to many Christians today. Satan is luring us. He's luring us into just little things that we think we're going to find our enjoyment in. And we have not discerned better, we have not known better, because we don't know God's Word. One evidence of our maturity is our ability to grow from the basics into strong doctrines. From the milk of the Word to the meat that is found in God's Word. Hey, what are you feeding on today? What are you feeding on today? If we're still feeding on the bottle, it's time to make some decisions and say, Lord, I've stayed too long as a babe. Lord, would you help me? Would you help me to mature in your word? Secondly, I want you to see that as Paul spoke to the church at Corinth, uh, he said this uh, in verse 3, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? You see, the Christians there, as they strove, as they, as they had divisions amongst each other, there was no restraint in what they were doing. I, I, I want you to understand that Someone who matures is one who goes from a life of chaos into a life of order, right? Uh, so a little child, uh, you know, little children, you see them. Oh, man, they're like buzzing around. They're playing with this, then they get up and they run and do that. And, and short attention span, then they want to do that. And you're forever trying to kind of get around them and pick up after them. And, and, uh, but if they did this for the rest of their life, you'll be pulling your hair out, wouldn't you? You want your children to go from a life of chaos, chaotic activity and, and short attention spans to someone who can sit down for a little while, can read a book for a little while, can study for a period of time, can apply themselves at something, can achieve some goals because of their discipline. And this is how we see and we measure maturity, don't we? There is restraint, there is a, an ability to, to hold oneself in a way to show that I'm not a little child anymore. I can take on responsibility. 
Well, that's the same thing he Paul is saying to this church. He's saying, you're still like little babes. You're still squabbling and fighting over your toys. Uh, you know, one says, I am a Paul. And the other, hey, my dad is bigger than your dad. And my father is better than your father. And uh, I belong to this group and you belong to that group. There was divisions among them. And Paul said, this is not right. It's not right that you have this kind of division. And that's all coming because you are still carnal. You're still babes. You're still acting like, a little, ch- like little children. Listen, the sign of us maturing is when we can learn to contain and restrain ourselves by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some people say to me, well, Pastor, now I'm just a realist. Whatever is in their mind, they just has to come out. It's like, hey, listen, would you mind just holding your tongue? Uh, would you mind just filtering what you have to say? Hey, listen, not everything that goes through your head needs to be spoken verbally and vocally for everybody to hear. And, well, I'm just being realistic. No, that you've been done. Yeah, a fool uttereth his mind all the time is what the Bible says. Uh, we need to learn to contain what we say. We need to learn to restrain ourselves. You know, some people get a little bit offended, somebody says something, and all of a sudden they throw the ball, you know, the toys out of the cot, and oh, I don't like this church, and I don't like these believers, and I don't like what's going on here, and they just march out. Well, don't throw your toys out of the cot that quickly. Learn to restrain your spirit. Learn that the Spirit of God can help you overcome your difficulties. You know, offenses are going to come. You're going to be offended by somebody. Someone's going to say something. Someone's going to do something. Someone's going to forget to do something. And you're going to get a little bit hurt. You're going to, get to, be, a little, you're going to be a little bit offended. You're going to be offended. But what are you going to do then? How are you going to respond to that offense? You see, some of us will just go all out and, and we're just going to make sure that person gets a piece of our mind. We're going to tell them exactly what we think and what they did. And, but that's not what the Spirit of God would have us to do. Would you learn to restrain and contain yourself? You see, we need to learn to restrain our flesh. We need to learn to restrain this carnal, this carnal flesh that we live in that can easily fire up. We need to learn to control it. And that control is only by the grace and the power of God. The Spirit of God in us. Paul said this in Ephesians, he says, not to be drunk in excess with wine, but be controlled or be filled by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. That means be under the influence, be under the control of the Spirit of God. Now you say, well, what does that mean? Well, you know what that means is that you have a choice. You have a choice by how you respond to circumstances and events in your life. You have a choice. You see, before we were saved, we really never had a choice. Uh, We just did that which came just natural. We just responded exactly how we felt. But now we have the Spirit of God. You see, you have now the power of God to help you restrain the flesh. Paul said, I I put my flesh, I mortify the flesh. I tried to, uh, to put it down because I don't want it to leave me. I don't want it to come forward. You see, that which you strengthen is that which will lead you. If you spend all your time feeding your flesh and strengthening your flesh, do not be ever surprised that you could not restrain it. Do not be ever surprised. If all your time is spent on watching TV and entertainment and being fed by the philosophies and things and the filth of this world, don't, don't, don't feel, don't, don't, don't be surprised that one day you begin to think that way and you begin to live that way. Don't, don't be surprised. See, if you strengthen the flesh, it's going to lead you. That's going to be your natural response because it has power. It's the strongest thing in you. You're just going to respond through that, through that mechanism. That's why we have contentions. That's why you would have sin and strife. Because we've let the flesh be strong in our life. We've given it the the ability and the empowerment in our lives to lead us. But that's not what the Word of God wants us to do as Christians. God wants us 
to be spirit-dependent people. Be people who are led by the Spirit of God and we lay down, we mortify, we choke, we stop the deeds of the flesh in our life and we become more people who are spirit-controlled, allowing the Spirit of God to lead me. Now, how, how does that work? Well, obviously, it has through my choice of submission to God's Word and to His leading. You see, I have every choice. I like what Jim Berg used to say, there are two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. In every circumstance, you have a choice. Would you choose the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life? Now, let me tell you, this is what will happen. You're faced with a circumstance or something that takes place in your life, and you have this response. You can either, boom, shoot from the hip as in your carnal state, or you can stop and say, Lord, help me at this time. Lord, would you give me your grace and your power to do the right thing right now? You have a choice. Either you're going to yield to the Spirit of God who will help you in that time, or you're going to do things that, are, that come naturally to you. So Paul here is saying to the church, hey, well, we need to show some signs of maturity. We can't continue as being as babes. Uh, we need to mature as Christians. Not only do we need to handle the Word of God now in a deeper way, but we need to show some restraint, some, some ability to control the man, the natural man, uh, this carnal man, and, and be more spirit-filled people. If I asked you the question today, what controls you? Do you just do things that just come naturally to you? Like, well, I'll just do what my mind, what my heart tells me to do. Well, the Bible tells us that's a dangerous path. The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can trust it? We should not follow what our heart tells us. We should be following where the Holy Spirit leads us. And as God helps us to mature in our restraint, that we're not fighting in contentions, but we're being led by one spirit. You know, when we, can you imagine what church would be like if everybody was truly spirit filled? Can you imagine what it'd be like when we come together, if we're, we were all people who chose to be led by the Holy Spirit? You know what would happen? There'll be greater unity in the church. You know what would happen? There'd be more peace and joy in the church. And there would be less contention among us. There, there will not be the segregation of people. Oh, well, I, I'm of this group and I'm of that group. And I like this pastor and I like this preacher. And I like listening to this podcast. No, we come together as one body. Christ, the Spirit of God, is what brings this unity together. Church would be an amazing place if we were to mature in Christ and be led by the Spirit of God and not by our flesh. Thirdly, I want you to see, and we'll conclude with this, in Hebrews, where we read today, Hebrews chapter 5, he said that they could not, they were still on the sincere milk of the word, verse 14, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, someone who's matured is one who has trained himself, has exercised himself to discern. Being able to work out a situation. You know, with our children growing up, we didn't always solve the problem for them. And we didn't always tell them what the thing they need to do. And now, certainly when they were little, we nurtured and we taught them what was right and what was wrong, what was expected of them. But uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to see how they would handle certain circumstances. You know, one of the, one of the great failures you would do for your children is when you solve every problem for them. Did you know that? Uh, one, of the greatest pro one of the dangerous things you could do for your children is when you pick up every offense that they have and you fight it on their behalf. Did you know that? You know, we have too many parents that, you know, little, poor little Johnny, I can't believe that this little boy stole his lunch at, at you know, uh, uh, at play school, at, at play. And uh, so I've got to march in there and I've got to tell that little boy and I'm going to tell that teacher, uh, don't let that boy do that to my son. Listen, we need to back off a little bit because handling these kind of things is part of the natural process. It's natural for us to, to grow and be able to handle things. 
You see, if, if you just fought and handled every matter for your child, you know what's going to happen with that child? Oh, yeah, he's going to advance in years. Yeah, he's going to become 13, 15, 20, 25. But every time he's got a problem in life, who is going to solve his problem? Mom, Dad, what do you think I should do? You're 30. You know, we laugh at that. But honestly, what are we like as Christians? How have we exercised ourselves, trained ourselves to be able to handle matters, to know whether it's right or it's wrong? You see, that's maturity, isn't it? Isn't that maturity when you say, okay, son, you're, you're a responsible person now. Daughter, you've grown up. I see maturity in you. I will let you make that decision. Now, sometimes for parents, that's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to just let go and let your children make a decision. Even though it might be the wrong decision, that's okay. They're going to learn from their mistakes. Did you not learn from your mistakes? You see, by exercise, by training, by being allowed, by being confronted by different issues and being able to make the right choice, being able to make the right decision, And if I've made the wrong decision, I'm going to pick up myself, I'm going to repent of it, and I'm going to get right again. I'm going to be back on the path, on the right path again. You see, that's what maturity is. Now, maturing, to mature in this way, you must be conscious about training yourself to get to a better level or to a better understanding. Too many Christians today are just so confused. I don't know really what God wants from them. Should I do this? Should I marry this boy? Should I marry this girl? Should I take this job? Is it okay for me to do this? Is it okay for me to go to these places? And you know what happens that many people come to me and say, Pastor, you tell us. No, 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 no. I am not going to define things for you. I want you to have a walk with Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God and let the Spirit of God help you to come to an understanding of what is expected from you and from your life. Because if it was me, what I'm defining, you'll only do it while I'm around. But if God convinces you of what is right and wrong, he's watching you all the time. I get people who say to me, well, in what instances am I allowed to do this? Well, I'm not going to tell you what instances. The word of God is there. I'll show you what the word of God says. But allow the spirit of God to mature you in your experience of him. To be able to determine what's right and what's wrong. Listen, if you truly know Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, we'll conclude with this. You have the same Holy Spirit as I have. I don't have, I don't have a better version. I don't have version 2 and you're still on version 1. Right? But we all have the same Holy Spirit in us. But what makes the difference? What's the difference? Why am I so clouded and confused and I don't know what to do? But pastor, you must have all the answers. No, no, not because I'm anything greater than you. It's just because I learned to walk with the Lord and listen to what he has to say and have experience in my life. I've made, listen, I have failed in areas of my life. I I am no super Christian. I'm just like you. There have been failures. There have been disappointments. But I've had to come and recognize them as the Spirit of God shows me. And I've got to come with repentance and say, Lord, please, please forgive me. I failed. Lord, I I did something that doesn't please you. Lord, would you help me? See, I've learned from God's word. I've learned from my personal experiences and my walk with God. What have you learned? In your maturity. How have you trained yourself to come to a better maturity in understanding what God wants from you? What experience do you have with God? Unfortunately, many of us live off the experiences of our parents or our pastors or people or spiritual leaders and we hear their stories and say, well, amen, but we've never experienced anything for ourselves. There is no true experience of walking with God and the power of God in us. All we are doing and hearing and living as Christians is about the stories of somebody else. And you can only feed on that for so long. A baby needs the nurturing of his parents. A child needs 
the protection and the direction and the help of his parents. But one day that child needs to grow up. And we rejoice and we celebrate life as our children mature, don't we? How about us as spiritual beings? How about us as Christians? Can we move from our complacency? Can we move from our childlike faith? Can we move away from just being babes in Christ and become mature adults in Jesus Christ? What a dynamic church this will be when we have the mind of Christ and we're living for Christ and we're reaching people with the gospel. What a dynamic place this would be if we learn to mature in Jesus Christ. That's God's purpose for us as a church. Not to stay as babes. Are you still on the bottle? Are you ready to eat a piece of steak? See, meat is for those who are spiritually mature. What are you doing about maturing in Christ? That's what God wants for you. See, our priorities will change. Our dedication to the Lord will change. Our service to Him will change. Life will be turned upside down when we move from being just babes and content as being little babies to being mature men and women in Jesus Christ. Oh, that God would do that work in us, in me and in you, as we mature in Jesus Christ. Let's pray.